Hi, this is Jeff Spence, your Math 135 instructor for the Community College of Denver, and this is our intro over hypothesis testing, section 9.1 in the book. So chapter 9 is all about hypothesis testing, and um, we're just going to do a short intro, mainly the, the information from section 9.1. So um, one of the big things in 9.1 we have to understand is constructing and, and the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis, and understanding really what they mean and how they frame the logic structure of what we're trying to uh, show. The other part of 9.1 is the types of errors that we can make in hypothesis tests. I'm not really going to talk about this too much. We're going to come back uh, when we've done a good amount of hypothesis testing uh, and you're comfortable with the conclusions that we can make and the process that we go through. Once we do that for a little while, we'll come back and talk about these errors, this type 1 and type 2 or 2 error that we can make when we uh, conduct hypothesis testing. So first, uh, with any hypothesis test, you, uh, you need to create the hypotheses. So the idea is, is that we're trying to um, make an estimation about a parameter. Uh, very similar to confidence intervals, but this time we have certain hypotheses that claim that the parameter is a certain value. So a, a certain parameter that we can talk about is the population mean. The last section that we just worked on was a confidence interval for the population mean. but uh, And that can give us a lower bound and an upper bound as far as an estimation. But sometimes we want to be able to make a, a concrete decision about the value of that uh, parameter. So sometimes it's unknown or we're challenging the value from a previous, previous uh, year or some other report. So we have to come up with these hypotheses. So generally, it, uh, the book per, uh, shows that the null hypothesis comes first, and generally we write that first. But usually the alternative hypothesis or research hypothesis, denoted HA, A for alternative, hypothesis A, is usually an alternative claim about the value of a parameter specifically made by a researcher. So sometimes a researcher would say, hey, I think that um, the population mean has changed from last year, or I think it's greater or less than. And so I want to say that I'm going to challenge that value, and that's the alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis is sometimes called the status quo. It usually just assume it's what we assume to be true, or it's basically um, what is come, comes from a previous report. So we have three types of tests that we can run. One that's called a right tail test, where we assume that um, the alternative is greater than the original value. A left tail test, where we also assume, or we're not assuming, we're trying to show that the alternative is less than the previous value. Or a two tailed test, where we just say it's not equal to that value. Generally, though, when we write our null hypothesis, h sub o, zero for null, we're going to write equals for all three of these. But basically they contradict each other. Okay, So the alternative is challenging the null and the alternative is what we're trying to show as a researcher. Okay, And so then the null is basically the opposite of that. So generally we're going to see some key words when you read a problem. You're going to have to basically read a research objective and identify the hypotheses. So sometimes when we say it's not equal, uh, so, so sorry, these are the symbols that we would use. And um, really it doesn't make any difference whether it's greater than or greater or greater than or equal to or less than or less than or equal to. But see, these are some of the key words that we see for the certain types of hypothesis. So when we see that the researcher thinks the value is more than, is larger than, or exceeds, that means we have a right tail hypothesis or much more greater than or equal to any one of those is a greater than or greater than or equal to. Other words you see less than, below, smaller than, much less, less than or equal to, that's going to be a left tail hypothesis. And anytime we see the words different or changed, that means we're doing a two tail hypothesis. Now sometimes you might not have enough information to understand that it uh, that it's either greater or less than but you think that it's just different. So that's when we do a two-tail alternative. So usually we just look for these keywords and then pick the form of the hypothesis, whether it be right tail, left tail, or two-tailed. And you have to write out these hypotheses. This is going to be a worth a point 
on every problem that I grade, the, the actual writing out of the hypothesis. So um, we'll look for the keywords, we'll write the form, and then we'll identify the mu sub zero, which is the mu from the null hypothesis. So generally, um, in a hypothesis test, we compare a sample mean. A sample mean is our uh, data, it's our evidence, with the value of mu sub zero. So let's just get to an example, and I'll come back to this stuff. So let's say that, um, like I said before, the SAT math section has a mean of 500 and a standard deviation of 100. So I think generally that the scores have improved on the SAT math in the last five years. So to test this hypothesis, I sample 50 students and get an average of 530. So the question is, is this difference statistically significant? Well, first, the null and alternative hypothesis. Since the SAT has, uh, basically you can look at the alternative first. I think that scores have improved. Improved means greater than 500. So that's your alternative right there. Think scores have improved on the SAT math. And since the alternative is greater than, we're going to say that the null is equal to 500. And it's actually been purported that, you know, the SAT section has a mean of 500 and a standard deviation of 100. So that's assumed to be true. Now, generally, the book will put a little zero by this mu right here, but I don't think that's really necessary. That's just the mu from the null hypothesis. So basically, what it's, what's going on in here is I'm challenging the mean of 500 and saying that I think it's actually greater than 500. So what do I do? I go out and collect data from 50 students and get an average of 530. Right now, I would say that that's some evidence for my claim because it's definitely higher than 500. But is it statistically significant? Meaning, is it is it rare enough to assume that it didn't just happen by chance, that there's a trend going on here, and that really the average of the SAT is greater than 500? So one way to test this difference, how big of a difference is this? I mean, you can see it's 30 points above 500, but we have to measure it in terms of a z-score because that really tells us um, how, you know, how many standard deviations above the mean, which gives us a much better idea of how much above the mean it is other than just this 30 raw value. So if I compute the test statistic, remember I have a sample size, so I have to take that uh, standard deviation divide by the square root of 50. And if I compute this test statistic, I find that the average of 530 from 50 students is 2.1213 standard deviations above the mean. Since it's 2.12 standard deviations above the mean, that's a pretty large difference. You might see 30 is not a very large difference, but since it's an average of 50 students, this difference is fairly large, two standard deviations above the mean. So generally in the future, we're gonna call this statistically significant. And since it's significant, I can say that I have enough evidence, so this 530 is a lot of evidence, to say that the null hypothesis is wrong, and the alternative hypothesis is what I claim, that the average of the SAT math has increased. Now I'll come back to this in a little bit. So let's go back to the, the general idea here. So remember in a hypothesis test, we compare the sample mean, which was 530, with the value of mu O, which was 500. If the difference is large, then the null hypothesis is rejected. That means we have a lot of evidence. If the difference is not large, then HO is not rejected, not much evidence. The difference is measured by a z-score, which I showed the, called the test statistic. So how do we test our hypothesis? With our statistic, which is the sample mean. And we measure that as a z-score. So we say it's statistically significant if it's unlikely to have occurred due to chance, meaning that we think that this 530 was not by chance, but actually because of the fact that SAT math scores are improving. And two standard deviations above the mean is enough evidence to say, wow, I think that the average has increased. If we got a z-score of maybe 1.1213, or you know, like 1.1 or something like that, then a, an observation that's one standard deviation from the mean happens fairly often. So we, um, we wouldn't call that significant. Later on, we'll talk about specifics of how we deem something to be st significant, statistically significant or not. So going back, the one thing that's really, really important, I'll mention this again, is that even though we rejected the null hypothesis, which was said that the mean was 500, 
and we claim that the, all, that the mean was greater than 500, we have not proved anything. The problem is, is that we have one sample and one average, and it could have happened by chance, but we're assuming that it did not. However, since we're making that assumption, we could be wrong. The average of 500 could still be the true average, and I could have just found 50 really good students. So the key thing here is that even though we're going to make the claim, let me go back here, I'm going to claim that the average of SAT math has increased, there is a possibility I could be wrong and that my evidence is leading me the wrong way. This is very much like a court of law, and this is where we talk about the type 1 and type 2 errors. I'll explain this table later, but you have to think of the null hypothesis a lot of times in these uh, or in these hypothesis testing situations. The null hypothesis is like a, in a court of law where we assume the defendant is not guilty. You, um, so anytime a, a defendant, somebody's charged with a crime, they're assumed innocent until they are quote unquote proven guilty. And then they say you have to show uh, enough evidence beyond a reasonable doubt, quote unquote, beyond a reasonable doubt to show that, or sorry, the prosecution has to show enough evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that they are not guilty and therefore, uh, or enough evidence that they are not, enough evidence that they are guilty and that the null hypothesis of them being innocent is false. So we'll talk about the errors later, but the main idea once again is this. We have a null hypothesis we challenge it with an alternative. The alternative can be right-tailed, left-tailed, or two-tailed. Right-tail is a greater than, left-tail is less than, and two-tailed is not equal to. We test our hypothesis with data, and we compute a test statistic to figure out the actual difference in our stat versus the null hypothesis, which we're challenging. If the test stat is large enough, we would say the difference is fairly large, and we have a statistically significant difference. If we have a statistically significant difference, we reject the null and claim the alternative is true. However, we did not prove that the null was wrong and, or prove that the alternative was true. We're just going to make the claim. The other conclusion that we can make is that if the, if the difference isn't very large, then we don't have enough evidence to reject the null and uh, we fail to reject the null hypothesis and that's where you just say, hey, I thought I had this claim. I collected some evidence. Turns out I didn't have enough evidence to make the, to make the claim that I had, so I failed to reject the null hypothesis. So when we come to class on Wednesday, we're going to be working through problems like this where we try to identify the null and alternative and make the correct conclusions, whether it be reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis. Those are the two uh, conclusions that we can make. So we'll see you in class on Wednesday. Good luck.